Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. A look at the progress and the shortfalls in the 50 years since the assassination of Martin Luther King. Tonight, I'm Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Terry Freeman, president of the National Civil Rights Museum. Hi, how are you? Good. And Elena De La Vega is associate professor of social work at the University of Memphis. Thank Hello. you for being here. Along with Bill Dries, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. We're here to talk today about a, a study that um, the National Civil Rights Museum, Elena, that you, you did um, uh, on behalf of the Civil Rights Museum mm -hmm. as part of the MLK 50 mm -hmm. uh, commemoration. Um, talk, maybe, I'll just say, you'll do it better than me. What was, what was the purpose of the study, the background of the study, and then we'll walk through many of the findings. Sure. So when we decided that the commemoration would have the theme of where do we go from here, it, it was important for us to kind of know where here was and to then take a look at the 50 years that had transpired since um, th this data uh, w was, was being developed. So having uh, been a fan, if you will, of the annual poverty fact sheet that um, Professor De La Vega uh, actually does, I thought it would be great to look at the current data and then take it back 50 years so we have basically a baseline on which to move forward. Where do we go from here? So that was the premise. And I also believe that, you know, it's easy for us to have anecdotes and, and stories about what we think is happening. It's important, though, for us to have data, hard data, real numbers um, that, frankly, you can't argue with. Um, you have to take them at their face value and move forward. And Elena, I, maybe I'll ask you, we'll walk through as much as we can in this time, and, uh, but some of the key findings um, from the report. Well, I think that the findings that are most important to me uh, beyond the poverty, I have been looking at poverty since 2011, so I wasn't very surprised at the findings and I wasn't very surprised at the differentials. Uh, the education I had also uh, kind of looked at before, uh, but it was very rewarding to see the gains in education, particularly since the 1950. And I decided to start in 1950 to have a nice uh, starting point before we even had Brown versus Board of Education and the bus mm -hmm. boycott and, and, and really uh, the important uh, moments in the civil rights movement. So it was really important to have a baseline for me. What really surprised me, what really struck me is that African Americans have made tremendous gains in education, taking advantage of every opportunity afforded to them uh, by you know all, all, all the legislation that, that passed since, but the median wage has remained about half that of whites pretty consistently through the decades, regardless yeah. of what else is happening in the economy or in uh, civil rights. We'll talk about some of the high, you start with the education and the high mm -hmm. point. Um, I think I have this right that um, high school back in 1960, only 6% of uh, African Americans in Shelby County were graduating from high school mm -hmm. or going beyond that. Now it's 85%, mm -hmm. so it's, it's an extremely high number. I, I would have actually was sort of surprised by that. I mean, the, the popular perception is that maybe that, that number wouldn't have been so high, I think, mm -hmm. which is probably a reflection on the media, if nothing else. And then college back in 1960 was barely 1% of African Americans were, mm -hmm. were completing a bachelor's degree. It's now closer to 20%. Mm -hmm. And I think what's important about that number is, if I'm correct, the national average for college completion is only around 20 to 25 mm -hmm. percent. So when you look at going from 1.2 percent to 20 percent, that's right there with the national average. That's pretty significant uh, gain in um, uh, baccalaureate or post, let, let me say post-secondary 
Um, right. um, but then the, the numbers, as you said, in terms of median income, that is still 50% of, of comparable right. whites across the board. Recounts. And that, that was, um, I, I don't know, I guess I'm a naive optimist. I, I had knew, known from other data, and you see that it's going to be less women make less than men. I mean, right. There's all the, that data mm -hmm. is out there. But 50% was, was certainly shocking. 50% regardless of what else is happening. You yeah. can have changes in everything else. Yeah. And you're not having changes in income. Yeah. So what is going on? Well, and I think if it were 50% having moved from 10%, 25%, 40% to 50%, right. but it has been consistently at 50%. So there is no, uh, the gap is not decreasing. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's bring Bill in. Uh -huh. And so now we have the numbers, and we have the numbers over a long period of mm -hmm. time to look at. Why has the gap persisted? I believe there are a number of reasons. Um, I think that we have to look at uh, our internal biases, and they may not be intentional, but uh, one of the things that research has shown is that when we have publicly available salaries, when we have salaries and wages that are uh, set by, by a rubric or by a, a, a level. Uh, so government jobs that tend to, or, or public school jobs that tend to not have a lot of flexibility. You enter at this rank with this experience and this education, this is the salary and it's published. Uh, that has almost closed the gap between black and white. But when we look at private industry, and private corporations, the gap remains. And uh, it, it's, uh, so that's part of it. And when we think about, um, we can think a starting salary that is a couple thousand dollars less is not very great. And it might not even be intentional. It might just be some internal bias operating. Uh, when we look 20 years down the road, because all salary increases are going to be a percent of initial mm -hmm. salary, the gap is going to be tremendously high. So, so, so the percentage comes into play here, but, and, and it starts with an initial bias that may be intentional or mm -hmm. may be unintentional, mm -hmm. but well, the percentage perpetuates it. Right, mm -hmm. and I, I do think that it's very natural for people to hire people who are like them. Mm -hmm. I think that that is just a very natural thing that um, it certainly takes into consideration some bias, but sometimes it is unconscious, uh, mm -hmm. the bias that, that exists, so that women hire more women, men hire more men, um, whites hire more whites, African Americans hire more African Americans. It's just what, is similar uh, to you, and I think that that has something to do with it as well. But I also agree that you know, if you're hired in low, you stay low. The the wage does not usually jump up unless there's a promotion. And in in the promotion situation, if you're promoted low, <laughs> you continue mm -hmm. to stay low. Yeah. So, so so Terry, what do you do with this information? Do do, do you do you have employers at the table? Do you have people who make these decisions at the table? And, and, and how does that discussion begin? Well, I think um, what happens with the data is first, get it out there, okay? So being able to put it out there into the public uh, view that people can't say, I'm not aware. Um, we are actually going to be getting this in front of business leaders at a breakfast that we're having uh, in partnership with the chamber. And we're gonna make sure that everybody leaves with a report. While it's not, the, the breakfast isn't about this report specifically, uh, they will leave with, um, with the report. And I think we get it in front of public officials as well. And they begin to kind of look at this data and say, where are we going to start? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't start everywhere, but you can begin to create a plan and a path path forward that begins to chip away at some of this. And it's, it's not um, a public sector issue or a private sector issue or a non-private sector issue. It's an entire community issue. And we have to deal with it from that perspective. It, it, Elena, w we are in an era where because of the tax reform that has passed, a number of corporations are repatriating the, their, their income that is out of the country. And as a result, they're giving bonuses, they're giving pay raises. Is this an opportunity in that kind of an environment to, to make 
corrections. Oh, we have the opportunity to make those corrections every single day, every single one of us. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit um, hesitant to say what's going to happen with the tax reform, and I would like to get more evidence. Uh, one case is not evidence, so I, I think we have to wait and see, maybe even a couple of years, whether that money actually was repatriated and whether uh, those bonuses came. Here is the problem with bonuses. They are probably even more subject to unconscious bias than salaries and, and things like that uh, because we also appraise the performance of those we supervise perhaps based on whether we like them. And uh, we, us humans, tend to like our tribe. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and this has been studied tremendously. So we know that we are going to, I'm not saying this is conscious, or that we're doing it consciously at all, but we tend to like those who look like us that we feel we have something in common with. And as a result, we tend to assess their work perhaps a little bit more favorably than we would otherwise. And the difference at the moment of making the decision doesn't have to be very great. In fact, what I would ask anybody who has any power, any ability to make those hiring and, and salary and bonus decisions is to look at their biases very, very critically because perhaps um, they're not aware. In fact, I think that most of us are not aware of having those biases and we have to be very conscious, uh, very deliberate in making those decisions to make sure that we are treating everybody fairly and that we're accounting for, for everything. I, I just wanted to add that I do think that there is a way that you can get around that a little bit in bonuses if you create a formula-based bonus, right? And so that it's formula-based, mm -hmm. everybody gets whatever the formula is. Now, obviously, it's based on the number that they start at, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I wanted to also make uh, the statement with regard to there are more and more companies going to bonus versus an increase in salary. Well. What that does is that gives you a bump in that year, yeah. but it doesn't help if you're building a, a, a retirement. You know, it doesn't help. It doesn't build your salary over time. And so what you end up transferring with is, a, is a, again, deflated salary because it hasn't moved over um, the course of time. Let me, a couple right. more yes. statistics from here that are, are relevant to what you're talking about. The, from 1960 to 2016 uh, in Shelby County, the, the percentage of, uh, of African Americans who were in white collar professions went from 8% to 52%. Oh. So that's some sort of progress. I mean, back to some of the areas where there's progress. Um, the, the percent back in you know 1960, 85% of African Americans were in blue collar jobs. Now it's down to 47%. But the, the study also pointed out that a white collar job, which maybe back in the 60s was associated with, with advancement, mm -hmm. with being right. in the middle class, right. um, white and black, now you can have a white collar job and be in poverty, white or black. Yep. Is that a fair that's, assessment of? That's of, absolutely yeah. right. If you think of the blue collar jobs in the 60s and the 70s, you're talking heavy manufacturing, you're talking um, labor unions, you're talking a really, really good wage. I mean, I think of the city of Detroit and black wealth was created in the, the car industry, right? They were able to send their right. kids to college, they were able to go on uh, annual vacations, buy homes, and that was on a blue collar manufacturing well, or, job. Or isn't, I mean, isn't Bill would know better than me, isn't Firestone an example in Memphis? Firestone, like Firestone and the Fraser Harvester, neighborhood what, and Harvester Clark. were the, the backbone of that blue collar, but solidly, mm -hmm. You know, more American dream oriented mm -hmm. to, what, to whatever degree that's true. And the decimation of, of Fraser, a lot of people would link to the end of those blue collar jobs. Into right. North yeah. Memphis, too, which yeah. was the, yeah. the industrial belt of the city. Mm -hmm. you, you also, yeah. one other statistic in here is, is and I'll try not to do too many of these, but they are fascinating as we talk about this. The percentage of, of um, uh, whites who are in managerial or professional occupations, which gets back to the kind of potential yeah. bias you're talking about right. and the people who give the bonuses, 47% right. of, of, of whites are in those jobs, 26% in, 
uh, of African Americans into those jobs. It's a, it's a huge increase from where it was in 1960 to sure. the 50 years. Mm -hmm. It went from 5% to 26%, but it's still a smaller right. number. Right. How much of, um, of all of this, um, we've probably 10 minutes left here, is um, the, the study focused on Shelby County, mm -hmm. um, studied on issues in Memphis. These issues aren't necessarily, or are they necessarily specific to Memphis? I mean, and, and how do you balance that conversation about the progress? MLK, Martin Luther King was not in here because there was in, in Memphis just because there was a problem in Memphis. It was a national, that's right, obviously a National Civil Rights Museum. But there is a way in which in Memphis, that part of what I'm getting to is we pick on ourselves, yeah. we're harder on ourselves. Uh, we're coming off Angela Rye, the, the commentator mm -hmm. who spoke at the event recently and was very critical specifically of Memphis not making the progress it should have. So how do you balance that? I think, honestly, I think you could go to almost any urban mm -hmm. center in America and you will find some iteration of this data. I don't mm -hmm. think that this is specific to Memphis. Now, I do think that the, um, that the child poverty rate for African American children is very high. I don't think you'll find that in every urban center. But these numbers should not, is, uh, these numbers are in my estimation more an indictment of America than an indictment of Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. And, and I will say just from the numbers here, and then we'll go to you, Elena, the, the percent of chi children in poverty in Shelby County uh, overall is 35%, uh -huh. which is sh sh uh, shocking. 11% of white children, 50%, 48% exactly. of black children. However, in, nationally, you've got 30% of African-American children um, in poverty. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly that that's a great number nationally no, by no. comparison, but it is much, much worse. But, it's but to your point. Well, and part of the problem is that a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we saw a decrease in poverty and in child poverty uh, nationwide, and yet we went in the opposite direction. So I think that is much more concerning, the direction in which we are moving. Uh, but I think it's very, very important to clarify that when we're talking about Memphis as the poorest area. We're talking about the poorest, large metropolitan area with more than a million people. So when we look at uh, smaller metropolitan areas or smaller cities, uh, we're not number one. Mm -hmm. In fact, Detroit and uh, the McAllen area are in much greater poverty yeah. than we are. Um, and then uh, the other thing that is important to point out as I'd like to uh, second what you said, as goes Memphis, so goes the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, we are really um, just maybe emblematic of the greater problems, but certainly not unique. Uh, yeah, Bill. You also looked at incarceration rates mm -hmm. and exposure to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Basically, your, your findings there, which again, we, we've seen plenty of anecdotal evidence of this, but what did your study find in that regard? Well, we, in 1980, the percent of African Americans and whites in, in prisons or institutionalized uh, was very, very similar. And, okay, you could say it's not great, but there appears to be some parity here. And uh, now, there is a much greater percent of African Americans that have been institutionalized. I did look at national data, and if you look at what I did here in Memphis and the national data, the graphs are almost identical. They, they reflect each other. And so that's, again, to your point of what's happening in Memphis is really a reflection of what's happening in the rest of the country. And, uh, Yes, we have a lot of work to do in Memphis and in Shelby County, and certainly we're, we are interested in this area because this is where we live and this is what we care about. But this is something that is a national conversation, should be a national conversation. These are problems that are affecting the entire nation. Mm -hmm. in, in our local conversations, the term disproportionate minority contact has, has come to be associated with with juvenile court. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, is there disproportionate minority contact in the adult incarceration system? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it definitely absolutely. appears so based on the data. Mm -hmm. And it, it appears uh, uh, to me that there were policy decisions that were made that impacted um, uh, the um, 
number of times people came into contact with the criminal justice system. Because of the consistency between the local data and the national data, um, there were some decisions that were made mm -hmm. that have impacted how we deal with um, criminal justice in our country. And I believe that there are some policy decisions that could be made that could also begin to help us decrease that. That and number. Decisions around mandatory minimum yes, sentences. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mandatory minimums. Really think, rethinking um, what we do around um, the possession of uh, small amounts of uh, illegal substances. You know, is that a crime that you think is necessary to actually put somebody in jail? Are there other opportunities for us to figure out how we um, have people pay, if you will, restitution for those types of crimes? Go ahead, Lynn. Um, I would like to point out that this doesn't start with the criminal justice system, it starts in the schools. And uh, I did some research that the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute published in the Hooks Policy Papers. And what I found is that uh, the, the rate of punishment and expulsion and suspension for African American children, mm -hmm. both in the former Memphis City Schools, Shelby County Schools, but also when Shelby County was independent, was up to 700 times higher for African American male students as for white students and other students. So we're not beginning mm -hmm. at the criminal justice system. We are taking children, and I am using the word in its traditional sense, small little boys who are being, uh, being harassed at, at a young age for behaviors that may not have anything to do. Well, and, and I, don't, I, just, I don't think it's helpful at all to remove children who are having difficulty in school from school. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's yeah, a different that's... way that maybe they don't need to be in that particular classroom. But um, the idea of restorative justice opportunities where we can, we, we need to keep children in school. That's where they should be. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to do on this, and it's interesting. We, we actually, because of just some scheduling things, we pre-taped a, a conversation with the U.S. District, uh, the U.S. Attorney, newly appointed in September, who talks. I will say a very, very different um, uh, perspective on. We didn't talk about race, but we did talk about mandatory minimums and, and who should be. So that show is coming up soon, and. and There'll be a very different point of view uh, expressed, you know, from the, 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 the coming from you know the Trump administration uh -huh. on down. With just three, four minutes left, I, we could talk more and more about this. The study is on the Civil Rights Museum site. It or, is. It is. Okay, it is. so you can get it there. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about MLK 50 sure. moving towards uh, April. What all is going on? What events um, should people look for? Well. What, where we're headed right now is into the, the first week of April, uh, second, third, and fourth. Uh, the second and third, we will have a two-day symposium on where do we go from here. We've partnered with the University of Memphis, uh, Cecil C. Humphreys Law School, and the law school will host that first day uh, with several panels throughout the day. They'll have a keynote with um, Eric Holder on Monday the 2nd. And then on the 3rd, the National Civil Rights Museum will host the second day of the symposium on the campus of, uh, the main campus of the University of Memphis and focusing on uh, labor issues in Memphis, um, the past, the present, the future, uh, economic equity and education and the promise of education, which it'll be interesting based on this uh, study, <laughs> what the promise of education actually is. And we have a keynote that day with Taylor Branch. Um, and then on the fourth, which is the actual 50th anniversary, we'll have a day of remembrance that will be in the courtyard of the National Civil Rights Museum. We'll have a variety of speakers and entertainment and speeches that will be delivered there. Um, organizations that worked with King or were a part of King's um, makeup, as well as other organizations that are doing the, the, the hard work now. And we'll have a commemoration in the courtyard beginning at 3.30, ending at 6.01 with a bell tolling across 
actually the globe. We've even found that there's some international I interest in uh, ringing bells. And then at the end of the day, we'll have an evening of storytelling with icons from the 20th century uh, civil rights movement and new movement makers of the 21st century. So conversations with these groups of people. And it, it, not to put you in a bad spot, but I, I do want to come back to Angela Rye and her comments recently mm -hmm. at, a, at a forum that was part of this. And he was, she was very critical specifically of things that were going on in Memphis. Do you think this spotlight, this growing spotlight that you've just articulated that's going to be on Memphis, is, is it, does Memphis look good under that light? I think that um, Memphis ad um, addressing the issues of the past, where we are presently and where we're headed is the best picture that we can present. I think the fact that people are thinking about where do we go from here is a very positive thing. Um, and what we want people to do when they come for the symposium is really talk about how the nation looks right now at this point and how the nation needs to move forward and within that how Memphis should move forward. So again, this is not at all an indictment of Memphis. I think um, the, the worst thing that we could do would be to sugarcoat where we are. I think it's important for us to be honest about where we are and, and optimistic about where we're headed. All right, we will leave it there. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.